much and welcome to the Earth Optimism Summit. We've had a slight change in the program for this session because thanks to an airline that will go unnamed, uh, two of our speakers are stranded in Toronto. Uh, we took a little time from the lateness of the introductory session, but fortunately one of the speakers is a woman named Ellen Kelsey. And we have worked so closely together for the last decade that I'm going to essentially tell her story, which is also my story. But I'd like to begin by showing a video that she sent us this morning. It's been a little crazy trying to, you know, needless to say, I got about four hours sleep as it was, and then I woke up realizing I was going to have to give a talk that I wasn't planning on. So uh, bear with us a little bit, but this is a really lovely video that gives you a sense of what Ellen Kelsey is like as a person, sort of just a bit of Ellen Kelsey, even though she's physically not here. I have to say she's the most uh, irrepressibly optimistic person I've ever met, but even she could not get a, not one, but not two, but three different planes that taxied onto the runway and turned back. She could not lift them into the air. So here she is on the screen, and then I'll say a few words afterwards. My name is Ellen Kelsey and I teach in the Masters of Environmental Education and Communications program at Royal Roads University in Canada and I also work on a research team at Stanford University and at James Cook University in Australia. Um, my project that I'm working on here at the Rachel Carson Centre is really looking at how do we move environmental narratives beyond doom and gloom towards more hopeful, resilient, um, more engaging solutions-oriented approaches. For lots and lots of years, I've been involved in conservation projects and sustainability projects, a lot of them in the marine environment, and looking at ways that people engage with those kinds of issues. And one of the things that I've found in my work interviewing uh, children and interviewing conservation biologists and environmental educators is that there is a real, um, strong emotional reaction to how we perceive the state of the planet. And that can be fear, it can be despair, it can be um, genuine anxiety, a feeling that things are really messed up. And that is proving through conservation psychology literature to be a real barrier to people's ability to, to enact a more sustainable future. So I, I guess what I'm realizing and, and what really drives me in my work is that we need to think about the narratives and the emotional implications of the stories that we tell about the state of the planet and be more creative and more open to alternative kinds of narratives that leave us feeling empowered and engaged and, and feeling like we really can enact the kind of futures that we're interested in having. So for example, um, really recent work on the idea that trees um, are not individual entities but are in fact part of social networks and that when a mother tree, some of the largest trees in the forest, when those mother trees are, are dying, they actually actively pass along their energy to the other components of their network, so to younger trees and other plants in the forest. In my most recent book, You Are Stardust, I really wanted to address this issue of uh, this sense of disconnection between children and the environment. And I wanted to do that by saying, you know, we really are just nature. Whether you're sitting in a car seat or you're sitting in the middle of a forest, you know, your hair falls like autumn leaves. When you exhale, you blow out pollen that may become a flower. You are intimately connected to nature. And those ideas of intimate connection are ones that astronomers are currently working with and we as environmental communicators are working with. One of the challenges in environmental humanities has been this kind of privileging of science so that we tend to think, oh, if we have a, an expert coming from a scientific viewpoint, they have more credibility or more weight in terms of their influence on environmental decision making. And what I think is really remarkable about the, the concept of the emotional landscape of environmental issues is that they are a perfect ground in which to look at the role of humanities because humanities helps us to understand the history that brought us to these feelings. It helps us to understand the social construction of our culture that reinforces those feelings. It helps us to understand the psychology underneath those feelings. 
And I think without that, we are destined to just keep replaying over and over again these stories of despair because we haven't critically analyzed why we feel the way we do. We just look at the evidence that supports how we feel uh, coming to us from uh, information about climate change or information about loss of species or any of these other very important science-based environmental issues. So for me, this field of emotions is the perfect place by which humanities and um, biological sciences come together in a very productive way to change the way we can live on this earth. Well, thank you, Ellen, from afar. We wish you were here. <laughs> um, I, I really like that video. Uh, especially the part about the tree, it made me think I'm 67 years old and I'm trying to spread this positive energy. Hopefully I'm not dying quite yet, but I am sort of doing that kind of positive energy thing. Um, I knew, I've gotten to know Ellen really well because independently, and I think this is the way that most ideas happen. They're never just one person with one idea and no, no similar ideas anywhere on the planet. Usually ideas happen because the conditions support and, and grow them. And so different people in different places have essentially the same idea. And I was, uh, I'm a coral reef biologist by training, and I um, saw a lot of really bad things happen right at the beginning of my career, that all the reefs that I studied on the north coast of Jamaica essentially died within 10 years of my studying them. And I spent years sort of telling the story of how horrible things were on reefs and how they're getting worse and worse. And I used to teach a class uh, with my husband, Jeremy Jackson, about um, marine biodiversity and conservation. And we'd start off the class in what seemed like a logical way, which was talking about the state of the ocean. But it turned out to be a really, really depressing way to start a class. And in fact, you could see it in the body language and the faces of all the students. They were, I could almost imagine these little bubbles over their heads saying, oh, why am I why am I going to go into conservation? It's so depressing. It's so hopeless. This is a big career mistake, and I've just written a check for $35,000 for this master's degree program, and I don't even like it. So I, we got this sense of, you know, this, that we weren't doing the right thing. And so uh, Jeremy and I actually started thinking about uh, the program we were running as medical school for the ocean. But if you think of it as medical school for the ocean, then you realize, well, you know, when you go to medical school, you don't, you're not trained to write obituaries of your patients, even though actually all your patients do wind up with an obituary. Um, you're, but we, what we were doing is running medical school for the ocean, and we were teaching our students to write ever more refined obituaries of, um, of the planet and the ocean in particular. And so Jeremy and I started running sessions called Beyond the Obituaries, and where we'd get together people just to talk about what was working. And that's, uh, that led to um, uh, Ellen finding me, because she was, for similar reasons, she was finding that anywhere between a quarter and a third of all children actually believe that the world is gonna come to an end before they die. So I mean, that's the level of environmental depression that exists in young people. So she called me up and said, you know, we need to do something about this. We're both trying to fight this negative, uh, this negative energy in the environmental movement. We need to start talking about what's working because when we talk about what's working, you can see people getting energized and, and being inspired. And so we ran a very small workshop uh, with a, another woman, Helen Kelsey, I mean, Helen, Helen Coldaway, sorry, um, Heather Coldaway, and we brought about 14 almost random people, just people we could find that were nearby to talk about it. And, um, and we decided to launch a Twitter campaign as one of the outcomes of this small weekend workshop. And so we had a whole bunch of lists of um, different possible Twitter campaigns, uh, hashtags that we could use, and we voted. And the winner was hashtag Ocean Optimism. So we launched hashtag Ocean Optimism in June of 2014, and it has since reached uh, over 76 million Twitter accounts. There was no PR money, no, there was nobody spent any money. It spread because of this hunger and this need to talk about what was working. And that's really the reason you're here today for an Earth Optimism Summit was really launched back then uh, talking about the ocean and success stories. So I just wanted to share that, that little piece of history as to how this Earth Optimism Summit came to pass. And I think what I'm gonna do now is seed the stage to the next speaker so we have plenty of time for uh, discussion. But um, 
there you have it. There's a little in your um, bag is a little um, sheet with two essays that I was involved in, one in science and one in nature. Gives a little bit more of the rationale for the Earth Optimism Summit. But I thought I'd share, since I had to speak for Ellen, I would share our joint history. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.